All right, so <laughs> our pipe is uh, 4,200 feet from the corner of the building up to the dam. Mm -hmm. um, it's six foot six inch inside diameter. It uh, carries about 2,200 gallons of water a second into the plant. Mm -hmm. uh, we have three Fra Francis machines in this building, and we have a Francis in this building as well, so we have a total of four machines. We have a uh, 1.5 megawatt output, and uh, that tower is there to release the pressure from the pipe during emergency mm -hmm. shutdowns. I can show you guys in here. This one's shut down. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit quiet. The water hog, this is the last one on, first one off. It's the least efficient. And this is what used to run this whole building. And this uh, shaft used to go 600 feet the length of the building, and it was belt drive all. This was a weatherboard paper place. And uh, all the equipment, five stories up, two stories down, was belt driven off of this machine. It's uh, about a thousand brain horsepower. And uh, this is the original governor for it because before it was used for electrical generation. The speed for their equipment. Now, because we have synchronous machines, the machine or the generator is always spinning at a constant RPM because it's locked in phase with the grid. So it's a 60 hertz system, is what we run in the United States. And um, that will only let this machine run 600 RPM. And uh, it's all driven over here. We have uh, that the big ship spins 200 RPM, the small one spins 600. And this is the only belt driven machine. But you can see how it's been modified. That shaft used to go all the way through. There were never any block walls there. It went 600 feet through the entire building. And everything was run mm -hmm. off belts like this. And this was a paper mill? Uh, leatherboard. Leatherboard. Um, paper type material. And they mm -hmm. actually used to drive the train right into this building. Because there's a train track up there. And they used to come in on the third story with the train. Wow. Dump everything off, and this was the equipment. And we, uh, because these are synchronous machines, when you put them online, you have to get them right to the right frequency before you close the breakers, or you get a massive influx of power to the grid, or if you're going too slow, into the building, and it's pretty dangerous if that happens. And these are they have uh, they're electromagnet, they're non-fixed magnet machines, so we have to apply. Um, a 48 volt DC current to the generator to actually get our 4,000 to our 160 volt output out of it. So we have a it's basically a giant car alternator, <clears throat> and it uh, spins at about a thousand RPM and creates our DC voltage for this machine. And each machine has one of these. But uh, most of them are static, or static state, so it's a solid uh, silicon thing now. These are the old-fashioned way of doing it with the alternator. And um, you've got a 48 volt DC backup in there. And we have, uh, because we're over a megawatt, we're, by law we have to have a pull-mounted circuit breaker. It's called a recloser. And you see the big square things on. When you see a square looking transformer on a telephone pole, it's a recloser. What happens is a branch goes across two lines, creates a short, and then it normally either vaporizes whatever caused the short or breaks the line. And the recloser will open and then automatically try and reclose every couple seconds for 30 seconds, and then you've got to manually reclose it. So. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So what happened, for example, did you, um, did you have to go offline during the hurricane? Um, no, no, but the, there was so much, uh, we, we sell our power on an ISO grid, it's mm -hmm. a five minute basis, so it's just like the stock market, but it changes mm -hmm. every five minutes. And what they do during emergencies like that, when there's so much power, so many power lines down, and there's still so many people producing electricity, there's nowhere for the electricity to go. So what they'll do is they'll drop the price to zero. So we're still producing electricity, but we're not getting paid. So it's an incentive for power plants to shut down. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the larger power plants will actually turn off because you're not getting paid for your electricity wear and tear and machinery and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So during the hurricane for about a 12 hour period, we were still producing electricity, but we got zero for it. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they like. Nitrogen 
apart and comes back out into the river. And this is a 1942 or 1941 uh, generator that came out of a ship, World War II ship. Well, age. And that's a uh, 280 kW right now. It's the most powerful machine, even though it's the smallest, because the efficiency has gotten. These machines are about 80% efficient, and this machine's about 91% efficient. So they only got 11% more efficient in 100 years. So the technology really hasn't gotten that much better. This one is a 550 kW machine. It was made in France, so it's pain to work on, everything's metric, it's just not as good as the old one. And it's the same thing except for it's vertical. Like this one could be horizontal or vertical, it doesn't matter, it's the same. And this is where the water comes in. That big pipe right there is the original diameter of the pipe that goes all the way up to the dam. Outside this building, it's reduced because they didn't want to bring that much water in an ancient pipe into this building because they did have a rupture to fill this building up with water in seconds. So it splits off and goes four, it goes three ways before it before it's reduced to diameter. We got one pipe coming into that machine and one pipe going into that machine. And the machine in the other building, the split is just like this, but it's underground out there. Another one that runs uh, our number one machine, which is in another room. So this pipe here is going to that machine up there, huh? What? This yellow pipe is going to the machine up there. Yep. And it's it's about 50 psi of water, and it's a 48 inch diameter pipe. Wow. It's a lot of water.
this machine's got like five million hours on it or something, astronomical. And it just goes and goes and goes. You literally turn this machine on, and you could not come into this room for six months and it'd still be fine. And it's a, it was top of the line when it came out because the other old ones are 200 RPM machines, and this is a 600 RPM machine, which from 1910 to a 600 RPM machine was unheard of. And uh, it's a Francis as well. It's only got a 21 inch diameter wheel, the wheel and it's this big, and it does uh, 350 kW output, so 0.35 of megawatts. So it puts out a lot of power for a tiny little runner, and it's very efficient. And uh, this machine right here, we have most of our machine our generators, they're either uh, General Electric or Westinghouse, even though General Electric wanted the DC thing back in the turn of the century, they were still making AC generators. It's the, the nameplate on this is 250 kW output, but this machine will actually do 350, and it's because it was rewound. And the, ins the modern insulation on the copper wire is that much thinner and that much better that they can fit that much more copper inside the transformer, inside the generator itself. So the machine had the power to turn it, so we're actually getting more output out of the same machine. And how old did you say that was? Oh, this is 1910. Wow. So and over 100 years old. It was, yeah, it was made in 1909, installed in 1910. And it came over on a the rails. And this is the same thing with the accumulator. This is a hydraulic accumulator. It's pressurized nitrogen with uh, hydraulic control on it. So if we lose power, we still have hydraulic controls to the machine. And it's got the same setup as number three, where this whole wheel spins like that, which simultaneously adjusts all the gates in there. There's fins on inside of each one of these linkages and they all spin together. And this is again back bearing, no uh, no roller bearings, no moving parts, and that's why they last so long. And we've also got they've got uh, chatter protector things that uh, detect any abnormal vibration and we've got temperature probes on each one of them. So the computer monitors all our temperatures, all our vibrations at all times. If there's anything that goes out of the norm in their preset settings, it'll set off an alarm will call my phone. And then if I don't get here in time and it keeps getting worse or it's getting hotter or something's going on, the computer will take over and start shutting down machines. <clears throat> so it's, pretty, it's a pretty good system. And it uh, was put it in the 80s, but they, it was actually an air conditioning system for large buildings in Boston and somehow they modified it to control a hydroelectric power plant. <laughs> and they were smarter than me. This is our, uh, when this program was actually written, because every program has to be written for an individual site, this was written in uh, like 1984, I believe. So it was written on like a green screen, DOS, like POS computer, and this, uh, this is the original program, so we have to have a DOS program running inside this, so we had to modify the computer and everything to be able to accept it, but it's advanced enough that I've got my pond level down to a hundredth of an inch, so if I can detect changes that are, you wouldn't, you, you go up there and you look and you can't see that there's been a change in the pond level and the computer's picking it up, and I've got uh, the outputs of each of the machines, every bearing temperature, the room temperatures, which is important in the winter so nothing freezes up. And uh, I've got control over this at home and here. So I can be at home and I can look at this screen and I can go into it and go across and open up any of the individual bearings and look at what their temperatures have been doing over the last couple of days. It was really well written program for back then. I think they said they spent forty thousand dollars writing this program, and it's still right. running, so it's obviously it was worth it. And they wanted to. We, we looked at getting a new one just to have a, a more modern one, and it was like a hundred thousand dollars to write a program like this. So why fix it if it's not broken? And uh, this is just regular computer, but I've got. Um, I can go on here and I get uh, the flow. So I know that this is the 
flow of the river, and the dam up above us is a state-controlled dam, and they manage it recreation purposes only. No other consideration in the state of New Hampshire, state-run dams, except for recreation. Like, they had a kayak event, and they want to get a whole bunch of people out there kayaking. They'll just open that dam and just dump a thousand CFS down there for like a day, and then they'll just shut it off. And they screw with the environment more than anyone does. <laughs> they do ridiculous things. Like, look at these. That's all, all those sharp angles and moves are just them just in an office of Congress messing with it. I'll be sending them a copy of this video. No, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> no, I'm just We're trying to be friends with them. I'm just kidding you. <laughs> no, but they've been working with, like, in the, in the summer we also have the reservoir level, and they have the summer water level, and then this time of year they bring it down. We've actually worked with them because they used to just open it and just dump water, and now we've got them so that they'll do it at more of a gradual rate so we can actually generate power with it because when they dump all that water, it just goes right over the top of the dam and the pond's empty in no time versus when they do a gradual release, we can use the power and there's no threat of mm -hmm. erosion and everything else. It's much better done gradually, just pretty much true with everything. And how much, if any, warning do they give you for these changes? Um, Sometimes they don't give you any warning and the computer just calls me and there's a high water alarm and I gotta fly up here 90 miles an hour and open the dam. Sometimes they'll cut it off and all of a sudden I get a call on my phone and all the machines are shutting themselves down. They don't know what's going on. No water. Yeah, but mo as of lately they've been giving me about a day's notice because we made a big stink about them doing stuff. And they could damage yeah. our equipment by doing stuff like that. Sure. So this been pretty good since we had a big meeting. Yeah, we had to go up there and have a big meeting with them. I don't think they really understood. No, I think they, they really didn't understand what they were doing downstream. And we're only one of a lot, I think there's five hydroelectric dams on this river. What river is this? Great Bay. This is Salmon Falls River. Oh. So we've got Milton Three Ponds up above us, and they control all the water release. And then there's us, which is the first hydroelectric dam, but there are two dams in between us and them. And then the next guy downstream, which this where you can see right here, uh, kind of goes out into a lake. Right there, that's a uh, Spalding Pond, and there on the back side of that lake, there's a dam, and that's a dam, that's a hydroelectric reservoir right there. So we're literally putting water from this hydro plant right into the next hydro plant, and that just keeps going all the way down to Great Bay. So this Salmon Falls River historically is. Uh, produced a lot of power, and um, there haven't been any salmon here for a very long time, obviously, <laughs> but we have a, a wicked healthy population of eels, and uh, they come up, dam we don't have a fish ladder on our dam, we're not required to because the eight dams downstream don't have them, and um, eels don't need fish ladders, period. Bottom line end of story, as much as all the guys in the DES talk about how they want to push it to be an endangered species so that you have to have uh, passage for eels. If you go up there at night, they just go right around the dam. They come up to the dam, they go right through the woods, and then you go around the dam, and they pop out on the other side. They have no problem with it. Really? Wow. Yeah. So all the flow from the river is coming through here? Uh, no, not all of it. We have, uh, we spill our minimum flow over the, through, that's the river right there. Okay. And this is just what's coming out the back. So. And we have a minimum flow, but the state dam doesn't have a minimum flow, so it's kind of like, you know, they do whatever they want to do, whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. I am. You guys want to go through the dam? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Past 10,000 CFS which is more than the upstream dam can pass. So they've got to get wiped out before we get wiped out. But we're pretty good. Okay. Yeah, that's the dam. These are our intakes. And this is our, our six foot diameter pipe goes straight shot like that through the woods, underground. And uh, these are our head gates. 
And this is just a big hydraulically operated gate. Shuts off the pipe if there's a rupture or any sort of emergency. We can come up here and kill it at the source. And just for maintenance as well. But when uh, in the fall, this is like, gets dump trucks, loads of leaves. Like you wouldn't even believe it. And a windy day in the fall, you're up here all the time. And these, uh, these trash racks are oh, that's probably 25 feet wide or so. And it's about 30 feet deep. And at the end of this boom, there's a brush. And these are actually, they're the best trash racks I've seen. I've been to a lot of plants. And it'll do this whole grate in one sweep. Mm -hmm. And most of the ones that you see at the other sites, they have to go sweep, 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 and work their way across. And I can do one and done. With uh, this. What does it sweep everything up onto here? It sweeps everything up here, and I just use a snow shovel and push it all right off the back side of the dam. Mm -hmm. And um, by law, we're not supposed to uh, pile any of the stuff on the shore bank, so everything that comes down the river has to go back into the river. So. And this is what's not going into the um, power plant. Is yeah, that correct? This is, this is our minimum flow. And that's set by law? Uh, yeah. Or by contract with you? Well, by contract. Not really. It's typically a contract is about uh, half, a, half a cubic foot per square mile of drainage area. And what's the drainage area? The area of, of the pond above you here? Or? Um, well, it's a little, it's, ours is, our drainage area is manipulated by culverts and stuff like that, but historically our drainage area is about 100 square miles. Oh, I, I got you. Okay. So now because water is diverted from mm. area to area, and sometimes someone will mm. throw a culvert in that might divert 10 square miles where the drainage out mm. of the watershed. So if nothing was touched, it would be about 100. And over on this side, basically remove it. Got an hour or two. And uh, this is so that we don't need to dismantle it. We leak, our leakage is almost minimum flow. And this is uh, all granite block capped in cement with uh, those pressure treated struts to hold it up. And what is this called here? These are the waste gates. This is just where we let excess water go during floods uh -huh. or a storm or just so we don't need to manually take the dam apart. Uh -huh. And they're all, this whole uh, dam is backed up with a generator over there in the building. So we have... You just want the main. Yeah, and that's main and this is main. Really? Yeah. And during hunting season, which is uh, right now a lot of people do a lot of our New Hampshire hunters hunt in Maine and Maine ha hunters hunt in New Hampshire and they drag their deer across this. Oh, really? Yeah, because it's the laws are different. Uh, you come up here and you see bloody drag marks across the dam. <laughs> Wait, so that's Maine right there? Yeah. yeah. Huh, that's cool. Yeah, this Salmon Falls River is the border between Maine and Maine. The high water mark on the main side. Yeah, I guess that's how it works. I think that's how it is on the Connecticut River. Yeah. They own New, New Hampshire owns the high water mark on the Vermont side. I actually, I, I know that for fishing game purposes, if someone is fishing, if someone's fishing in this body of water and they're on that side and they have a New Hampshire license, they're safe. Yeah. But if I don't know Maine where the you go over there, you get in trouble. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. It's, but uh, fishing here is awesome. They're huge bass in here. And down on this side, they like they stock the stream or they stock the pond upstream with trout. And they all they open up their dam and they have under dam passage. And we typically do over dam passage. So they just open up big pipes underneath their dam, and it sucks all the fish and everything out of their pond. And they all pile up in here, and they can they can get back up during like extremely high flow and stuff like that. But uh, 
for the most part, we get a concentration of like really good fishing here. <laughs> Everyone comes here to fish. And right down here, sometimes in the fall, in those pools, you'll see a lot of brown trout in particular. It's the big stock. And our, our trash rack spacing is three quarter inch, so we don't, you know, nothing will go in there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and we have less than uh, one foot per second of flow. So um, we, we qualify, that's one of the qualifications for green energy so that you can't entrain anything on the racks. So regardless of the fish species, in theory, there's no way they, they could get suction up to the rack because they'll and always be, be able, able to, to overcome yeah. that current. <clears throat> and that big yellow boom is just a, an effort to divert most of the, the leaves and debris that comes down the river over the top of the dam versus through your sluice. Yeah, into the racks so that someone has to come up here and clean it. And they worked really well. That came from the BP oil spill. Did it? Yeah. Although it was no, we never had <laughs> it. Oil. Was, it didn't, didn't have oil, but it, but it that's was surplus. Just what they used, you know. Yeah. Works great to keep the leaves out. Yeah, right. ninety. It stops ninety percent of what comes down the river. You take it out, and we've got to take it out soon because of the ice. And uh, like overnight, you get three times as much junk on your trash racks. Do you go in the water to take it out? Oh no, I'll just pull it out from over there on the shore. Alright. <laughs> we do swim here occasionally to fix stuff on the dam, but not this time of year. Yeah. It can wait. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I have a cylinder in the bottom of them. 